Hello there, my name is Ollie and I'm a final year medical student. Hey guys, Ollie here, welcome back to the channel. I'm now a final year medical student at the University of Warwick in the UK. So as of this past Wednesday afternoon, myself and my cohort who started in 2017, September 2017, we are now officially final year medical students, one short year away from becoming doctors. You might notice I'm wearing a very fetching scrub top. This is for a particular reason, and it's because we're very much into our clinical years, our obviously final clinical year, where you are based in the hospital environment much more than you are in lectures. Particularly at the moment when we've got COVID just wrecking everything left, right and centre, we can be in scrubs all the time, regardless of what we're doing, because they're much easier to clean and maintain. So with that in mind, I thought this would be a great chance to do another Q&A, having passed this milestone, and you guys can get a feel for what's going on. But more so than when I've done these in the past, I'll try and keep my answers brief because there's a lot of questions to get through and I want you guys to hopefully get something from it. I've got two questions from my colleagues clearly, which are how the F did we get here? But yay, thank God. And how did I get so far? How do I do this? Send help. Yes, we have come a long way. I found this picture recently of our offer holders day, which Many of you who are coming to start at Warwick in September 2020 will have just experienced virtually. That was a whole three years ago and we have come so, so far since then in terms of knowledge, competence, age. <laughs> so into the actual questions, Courtney asks, what are exams like after medical school? How often? Now, assuming this wasn't a typo and it wasn't asking about exams at medical school, Postgraduate medical exams are a whole thing unto their own. And it's honestly not something that I know an enormous amount about, but I can, I can speak very generally. So when you finish medical school, the, the major next exam that you will sit is your college membership exams relevant to the type of specialty that you want to do. So if you are an aspiring surgeon, you will have to take something called the MRCS exam, the membership of the Royal College of Surgeons. There's a part A, which is the more theoretical part, and then the part B, which is the OSCEs, the clinical competence. They are very expensive to take. I think the part A is about 600 pounds and the part B about 1,000 pounds. And ideally, from what I understand, you need both part A and part B by the time you get to ST3 level. So what that means is when you finish medical school, you have your F1 year, your F2 year, then depending on the specialty you take, you will have core training one, core training two, and then when you get to three, that, that then being your fifth year post-graduation, you're expected to have the relevant college membership exam. So if you want to be a surgeon, that's your MRCS. If you want to be a medic, that's usually going to be the membership of the Royal College of Physicians, your MRCP. Again, it differs depending on the exact specialty that you want to do. And then a few more years down the line, you have your fellowship exams, which are usually required to become a consultant. And again, I think they depend much more on the particular specialty that you've chosen, which you will obviously be much more ingrained into by then. So for me, at least, I'm going to try and do my MRCS part A in my F1 if I can then in my F2 if I can't, that's that's when I kind of want to take it. Okay, someone has asked, comment on my last pick and I'll return the favour. Um, okay, th this is just going to be a very brief thing, point of information. Um, I'm very, very lucky, very, very blessed that I have a platform which has some considerable reach. It's not massive, but you know, it's, it's pretty focused. We've got a good audience of, of about 10,000 people across all the different platforms. And as you might imagine, because of that, I get requests a lot, often multiple every day, asking me to share stuff. People wanting to collaborate or people wanting a shout out on their projects. And that's great. I don't, I don't disavow that kind of behavior. The problem is, right, is that because of the frequency of these requests that I get, I do not want to share everything that comes in because otherwise I'd just be sharing people's content all day long, every day, which given that I want quite a tightly curated feed that I know is going to be useful for you guys that put in the effort to engage with my stuff, that's part of it. And the other part of it is that I don't like sharing stuff that I do not use or that I do not think is of, of good and consistent quality. And that's not to say that these things that people are asking me to share aren't of good quality 
or consistently reliable. The problem is, is that I get too many requests to vet each and every one of them. Just generally speaking, if I come across something and I like it, I'll share it. Um, I don't I don't tend to engage with people just asking me to share stuff unless it's something I'm familiar with or something that I would share by myself anyway. Maybe that's rude, maybe that's wrong, I don't know. I'd love to know what you guys think about that. Vinny Gradmed asks, which aspect of final year are you looking forward to the most? To be honest, mate, I'm looking forward to finishing. Um, this will be my seventh year at university and I'm so ready to kind of be out of the system and to be working. I want a bit more reliable structure in my life. I want a paycheck. I'm looking forward to having something where the goals are a bit closer in my life, whether that's just treating a particular patient or finishing the working day, things like that. Because really at Warwick, there's nothing that separates year three from year four. Those two years together are considered phase three, which is the phase that prepares you for finals. So going into final year, I will not be doing anything that I haven't already been doing in year three. It's just you need more time to get through all the different rotations. So is there a whole lot of stuff to do in between now and finishing? Absolutely, we've got final exams, we've got the SJT, I've got my jobs to select um, in October, which I'll talk more about later, applying for my first job as a doctor. But to be honest, more than anything, I'm looking forward to finishing. I have this weird rash on my butt. Do you think you could diagnose? Um, my dermatology knowledge is spotty at best. Get it? Um, no. <laughs> no, as ever, even if I could diagnose your weird bum rashes, uh, I cannot give medical advice. SRK Studies wants to know the best thing about studying at Warwick. I think, personally, studying alongside people who are exclusively graduates has been one of the best parts of the course. I realise that's not really a comment on the medical school itself. I'll split into two things. I think the anatomy teaching you get in first year is world standard. It's absolutely unbelievable. The quality of the teaching, the quality of the models and the specimens that you have access to. If you like your anatomy, if you're thinking about surgery, Warwick would be a great, great place to go. I've definitely benefited from being around people that are more my own age with similar priorities. You've kind of done your undergrad, you've, you've done the partying, you've kind of worked before and you, you understand a bit more about how people work. I think that leads to a much more wholesome and productive environment in most cases. Medheads2020 wants to know, what would be your advice for a first year? What I think I would say is don't be afraid of having everything you thought you knew about studying turned on its head. Med school is really hard and it's really different from undergraduate study because virtually all undergraduate degrees are about a single topic or a very narrow range of topics studied in depth. Medical school is not. It's a huge array of different topics, often topics which don't seem to overlap with one another and are just fairly abstract. It's knowing a little bit about a lot of things but being able to tie those things together. And prepare to be frustrated if you have specialist knowledge like I did when you go in to have that knowledge challenged and to have that knowledge not be what the medical school wants. You have to learn in the way that your medical school teaches you. This is why I think statistically it's the science grads, the biomeds, the med size, the molecular biologies. It's those people that fail the first sits of exams because they go in thinking they know what they're doing, but what they know whether it's correct or not, is often not in the format that the medical school wants. So you have to just clear your mind, get rid of your hubris, and prepare to knuckle down and learn again like you're starting from scratch. That's what I would say. A up Oz, I guess, uh, wants to know, what's a good UCAT score for Warwick? Looking to apply there for 2021. This is really difficult because there's not really any such thing as a good UCAT score. Obviously, if you get a perfect 900 average in every section, that's going to be better than someone who gets 600 but it depends where you want to apply and whether you're applying for undergrad or postgrad entry. Graduate entry medicine courses are always going to be more competitive than undergrad just because of the number of places available and increased competition for these funded places. So what I would say is for an undergrad course, I'd be aiming for 650. I think I'd be applying with a score of 650 or higher. For graduate entry medicine, I think you're aiming between 700 and 750. 
if you can do that. Although Warwick, I would say, tends to have much lower UCAT thresholds than some of the graduate entry medicine schools. So when I applied, I had a 693 average, which was the second lowest UCAT score in my entire year but obviously I still got my place. I have heard of, in years since, people getting in with scores of like 670, 660. So actually, you know what? If I had a score around 670, I think I'd still be putting in an application to Warwick in that case. But knowing that that probably wouldn't be enough for places like King's, for example, or Newcastle. Then they've submitted another question. Do Warwick look at A-levels or GCSEs? Is a B-tech acceptable alongside a 2-1 or a first side BSc? Again, it's a pretty blanket statement. Warwick doesn't care what you do as long as you've got a 2-1 in any subject. Um, I realise people think that there's often some trick or something else going on, but as they say on their website, as long as you've got a 2-1 in any degree subject and you've got the minimum work experience requirements, you're as good as anyone else. There's no advantage to any particular degree or course or work experience or whatever. It's a minimum requirements cutoff. As long as you meet the minimum, you've got the same chance as everyone else. Lolzy Wolsey asks, are you anxious about becoming an actual doctor? Yes, terrified. <laughs> There's a thing that's often said about medical school education, which is really, really true, which is that no one tells you how to be a doctor until literally like the last six weeks of the course of any medical school program where you do your what's called almost an assistantship. You're essentially buddied to an F1 and you shadow them doing their job for a month and a bit. But until then, at medical school, what you're learning is the theory and the, the examination-y type stuff. You're not learning how to actually do the job of an F1. This is why I'm sure the nurses and the nursing students and the other healthcare professional students out there will laugh when I say this, but this is why F1s, particularly when they start, often seem so incompetent and they don't know about how anything works. It's because you're not taught. You don't learn that stuff until after your final exams most of the time. Uh, Sonder Bubble wants to know, how's it going so far? Yeah, it's pretty good. I'm having a nice time. <laughs> I'm three years deep, so I've done my preclinical year. I've done my kind of first year of, of clinical placement. I've just completed my second year of placement, uh, done bits of research. I've been involved in lots of cool projects, been building this YouTube channel, done a lot of teaching. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot going on. I've had a really cool time, very stressful, and I think I'm probably more anxious than I've ever been in my entire life. But I think medical school tends to do that to people. Uh, NTTK wants to know, how does it feel being a final year med student? As I kind of alluded to before, there's no functional difference at Warwick between year three and year four. They're all one continuous phase. So in year three, you start your what are called specialty rotations, which might be paediatrics, psychiatry, surgery. These were historically six week blocks. They're now five weeks owing to the time we've lost to COVID. But you started those in year three and they literally just continue all the way through until finals. So practically speaking, there is no difference between final year and third year other than they have your final exams at the end of final year, no exams in third year. We feel the seniority, I suppose. We are the most experienced and in theory most knowledgeable medical students at Warwick Medical School now just by virtue of being old. So I guess all that means is that I'll try and bear in mind that the people, particularly you guys coming in September, if anyone's starting at Warwick, that we're in a really good position to teach you guys because we have, I think, the most complete clinical understanding of any of the students here. So if anyone wants teaching, hit a brother up. Which year of med school has been the most challenging and why? First year was definitely the hardest for me. The pre-clinical year at Warwick, where you go from knowing no medicine to almost the entirety of pre-clinical medicine, which normally takes the best part of two to three years, at medical school, doing that in less than a year and taking a set of very high stakes exams. Honestly, I look back at some of the, the footage and the content that I was making at the end of first year and I think it's quite clear that I was having some sort of breakdown um, towards that point, just because the amount you needed to know and the amount that you potentially could be examined on is just so unbelievable, particularly considering you've not just got the theory, but your OSCEs. You need all the, the clinical exam stuff as well. There was just a lot. 
Although once you get through that first stage, once you survive first year, you can then thrive and you really settle in and getting through that first year set of exams, it really cements that knowledge. And I think you know a bit more about what you're doing after that. And I certainly didn't feel anywhere near as anxious about the second year exams as the first year ones. What have you found to be the hardest part of studying med? Uh, I think it's just identifying what study methods do and don't work for you. Because sometimes some things will work and then for a different subject matter they don't work. As well as motivating myself to study the things that I'm just not interested in, but are a really important part of clinical management and clinical understanding, like pharmacology and haematology particularly, I just find kind of dull as dishwater. I just don't care from like an intellectual curiosity point of view, whereas my anatomy, my neurology, I love that stuff and could just read voraciously for hours and hours and hours. But I think equally being aware of the stuff you don't find interesting means that you have to put effort into studying that stuff. And my pharmacology is actually pretty good. I got 90% on our most recent mock PSA, uh, the prescribing safety exam, because I've put the work in, because I know that it's a weakness. So I have to compensate for that by putting in extra work. I hope that answers the question. Aqua Green Lagoon wants to know, have you found your skills, med school experience has been in comparison to other medical schools and why? Um, what I would say is that I think at Warwick, because of the nature of the course, you become what I'm gonna call minimally competent much more quickly than I've seen virtually anywhere else. Admittedly, that's limited to medical schools from the Midlands kind of south because I've not visited the Northern Medical Schools basically, but there's certainly a stark difference between graduate entry medics and undergrad medics in terms of, I think, how much knowledge is retained. I think GEM students seem to acquire a more complete clinical understanding more quickly because Warwick have all their clinical skills from the very first year. You actually don't do much more in the way of clinical skills in the later years, you do the vast, vast bulk of it in the first year alongside your preclinical studies. I do think that Warwick makes their students able to do a history, do a complete clinical exam and hand over their findings much, much more quickly than, than most other medical schools that I've seen. What was something you thought you'd struggle with but found okay? I was a bit worried that my lack of clinical experience would be a bigger problem than it has turned out to be. So I didn't have any hospital-based work experience. I don't think I'd set foot in a hospital in like the last 10 years before coming to medical school because my work experience was all either mental health or community, um, both of which were very, very valuable. But having not worked in the NHS before, not being used to the healthcare environment, and I certainly had to learn, you know, how all these things work. But what I found actually is that most of your ability to get on on the wards is just being able to chat shit to patients in a comfortable and reassuring type of way. And actually that's what patients do, I think, want from their healthcare professionals and their trainee healthcare professionals. And I knew that about myself. I think that that's a, a strength that I have usually is that if I can get sat in front of someone and talking to them, I'm usually okay. It's the getting to that stage uh, that if I am going to struggle is the area that I struggle with. And so I guess anyone that has worked in a healthcare environment before coming to med school will will find it much easier probably than someone like me who hadn't. Uh, Epidemiopedia says, congratulations. Thank you. Are you excited to finish? Yes, very much. I've really enjoyed medical school, but I'm very ready to be working and out of university and having my own life a little bit more that would be nice uh two people have asked what specialty would you like to follow or what specialty would you like to go into great question i'm going to give you the same caveat answer that i give to everyone right which is that i'm like 90 percent sure that i want to do neurosurgery um so obviously the portion of surgery that is involved with the brain and the spinal cord and it then has a load of different subspecialties. There's things like functional neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery, skull-based surgery, so on and so on. What I would say is that it's absolutely fine for people to not know what specialty they want to do. And honestly, I wish that we could make the decision much later in our medical careers because 
There's so much of medicine that I just haven't seen yet. I really like the idea of surgery, but obviously I've never worked as a surgeon or even as a doctor. So the idea of committing, you know, 30, 40 years of my life to that seems somewhat strange. But the problem is, but the problem is particularly for competitive specialties. So things like cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery, neurosurgery, is that they're competitive. I think people often don't realize that, but you have absolutely no guarantee of getting the specialty that you think you want to do. And so you have to interview and be selected and given what's called a training number. So for neurosurgery at the moment, it's like five or six applicants per place, all of whom are very competitive, very smart, and are as qualified as you are or better. So you have to prepare a portfolio, doing things like research, audits, surgical shadowing, going to conferences, getting your skills up, you know, going on courses, all of these things cost time, all of these things are expensive and you have to start early because particularly for neurosurgery and what are called run-through specialties, you actually apply for your specialty post at the end of your F2 year. You actually apply for your specialty post in your F2 year, which is less than two years after you finish medical school. F1 is horrendously busy, you don't have a lot of time for these things, so that necessitates starting this whole process while you're at medical school. And honestly, that has been one of the most anxiety inducing things that I've had to deal with because, you know, I want to maintain my grades, make sure I'm getting the experience on the wards, but also doing all these projects, doing this YouTube channel, doing all these other things. And it's been a drain, um, but it's all to try and put myself into a more competitive place when it comes to getting that specialty job. So if not neurosurgery, I think some kind of surgeon, I really want to work with my hands and get the gratification of surgery. If surgery doesn't work out for whatever reason, I like emergency medicine. I actually really like pediatrics. It's turned out that I, I find talking to kids on the wards and kind of calming them down and reassuring them, it's something that comes quite naturally to me. It's something that I realize doesn't come easily to many people. Maybe that's something to look into, but the problem with those medical ones particularly is that I don't have the portfolio or the experience at the moment. So, you know, I've got a few years to think about that yet. Uh, Paolo A93 wants to know, what should I do or read to prepare for medicine at Warwick in September? Again, no one listens to me when I say this, but I believe it, do nothing. As long as you're clued up on like A-level biology, maybe, but only as far as the human biology stuff goes, do you know how DNA works, how cell replication works? Have you seen the Krebs cycle before? As long as you've got these very basic ideas down about how proteins are made and how genetics works at a very basic level, take the time off because you're not going to get the time again. And over preparing, and over preparing, particularly engaging with material that is meant for clinical year medical students, is simply not going to help you with the first year at Warwick because it's all theory, it's all preclinical. None of it is about disease management, it's all about the underlying pathology and more the cellular processes and very basic anatomy. But the course assumes that you have no knowledge going in, so I honestly don't think it's worth preparing. Just enjoy the time off, you're not going to have it again. Uh, tai Chi, proud of you. Oh, thanks Raj. How's your journey been? Where do you see yourself in five years? Um, I'm 24, I just turned 24, so in five years I'll be 29, so what will I be in? One year I'll be in UF1, two years in F2. So I guess I'd be starting my S, what would be my ST3. Although I want to take a year out after my F2, either to do a master's or a teaching job, or maybe a junior clinical fellow job. So an F3 year is, is something that people do, take a bit of time out of medical training. You might just want to go traveling for a year or just not doing any medicine or taking a teaching post, or preparing for a specialty application. Either I want to do a clinical teaching fellow job in neurology or anatomy, if I can get it, maybe anatomy demonstrator job, or I know for neurosurgery there are these junior clinical fellowship jobs, which sound really good. They're in London, though virtually all of those, so that would mean a move to London. So I guess it's potentially true in five years that I could have a neurosurg training number, or I could be a core trainee, in a medical specialty by that point? I don't know. It depends on how the next few years go, really. I hope I'm a competent doctor in five years. I think that's something that I would hope to be true in the next five years, minimally competent. Advice for first year at Warwick, take everything as it comes, deal with one challenge at a time, 
Don't worry if you feel behind, you will always be behind. Welcome to medical school, you'll never be in front ever again. The same person has asked, what do you wish you knew before coming? Um, and they've suggested that that could be a video. I think I will make that its own video because that's, that's a really good topic and I have some thoughts. How long are the summer holidays from year one to four? After year one at Warwick, you get a full normal university summer, you know, several months or whatever they are. You don't get a summer holiday after that. It's a very intense course. You still get some time off around Easter, around Christmas, but make the most of that first summer holiday because you don't get another one. Like I think we had, I think we had the best part of two weeks off after our second year exams and then starting third year. And then we're obviously in what would be the summer now and I'm not getting any breaks now. I think I get four weeks of leave or something between now and finals and they may have gone, I don't know, with COVID. Tweets by Reet wants to know, what's the general perception of doctors coming in from abroad in the UK? Um, I guess saying this as sensitively as possible, it's always going to be a mixed bag. What I would say is, as a consequence potentially of going to medical school in the West Midlands, most of, uh, maybe not most, but a significant, significant chunk of the doctors uh, that practice around here, particularly the consultants, are not UK medical graduates. And actually there's one hospital near me which seems to be staffed almost entirely by, and again, this is gonna sound a bit weird, but it's not meant to be. Anyone who's worked in healthcare probably understands what I mean when I say the particular breed of old school Indian consultant who just seems to know everything about everything um, in medicine, regardless of what specialty they're in. And one of the hospitals around here seems to be staffed entirely by that kind of doctor. So, you know, are those doctors who are non-UK graduates far better than virtually any other doctor that I've ever seen? Seemingly. What I have seen is some doctors coming from EU medical schools, particularly places like um, Romania, Poland, who sometimes need to do a top-up year working in the NHS. Not that they're not medically qualified, they are, they're just not trained in a system that has anything equivalent to the NHS. So we've seen quite a lot of doctors coming and doing those almost placement years working pre-F1. And then the only other thing to say is I've seen registrars from other countries coming in and doing specialty training in the UK. They seem to be very smart and they seem to get it. It's just sometimes the processes, things like how to do an audit within the NHS or getting, you know, ethical approval for research and the more information governancey stuff, they seem to find more difficult. And that's something that I've been able to help them with if they've wanted a bit of help and then they can help get me onto projects and stuff. So no, it's never been a problem. I don't feel like foreign medical graduates, there's no stigma, certainly in, in what I've seen. People just seem to slot very easily back into the system, if that makes sense. Then the last question from Graduate Entry Med is, where in the country do you want to work? Um, I'm just going to focus on the in the country question because people ask me a lot, do I want to go and work abroad? Uh, you know, do I want to go to the US, Canada, Australia? So on, would that be a smart career move for me and probably good for my life? Yeah, it probably would. Um, working conditions in, in other places are often better for young doctors than they are in the UK. Am I going to do that? Probably not. I feel a certain amount of, not debt towards the UK health system, but, but certainly um, gratitude because we're taxpayer funded, our medical education and training doctors. And I think the NHS has a lot of problems. I want to try and make changes within the, the NHS, certainly as I, as I progress. And I think the only way you can usually do that is by changing things from the inside. Maybe at the other end of my life, I might go and practice in another country, but I think I would like to train certainly in the UK to consultant level, I think, um, which is obviously gonna be the bulk of my working life anyway. So am I gonna stay in the UK? Probably yes. Where in the country do I wanna go and work? I want to go and do my foundation years in Newcastle. I'm trying to get an AFP, an academic foundation job in Newcastle, which isn't horrendously competitive. Neither are foundation places. I certainly don't wanna go and do my foundation in London. Um, I wanna get used to being a doctor in somewhere that I'm more familiar with. I did my undergrad in Newcastle. I think it's, Newcastle is one of my favorite cities in the UK. So I think that would be a great place to go. 
Whether I go and work elsewhere as a registrar or a trainee um, remains to be seen. It depends on the jobs, but my F1 and F2, I'm going to go to Newcastle. So thanks very much for watching, guys. That's where I'm going to end this. I hope it hasn't been too long. Thanks very much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for more videos just like this. If there are any questions that I haven't answered, please just leave them down in the comments, and I will see you another time. Take care, and bye-bye for now. If you want to help me out, guys, there are three ways you can support the channel. The first is like, share, comment, and subscribe if you'd like to see more. You can buy me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link in the description below if you found it really useful, or you can save 10% off your first year of Complete Anatomy 2020 using my referral link in the video description below, and I'll get a small kickback when you do. Thanks very much, guys, and I'll see you in another video.